Scripture says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. We come this morning to worship a God who is wisdom, far beyond our searching minds, a sweet mystery to be found amongst the commonplace. Our worship brings us into contact with a grandeur of eternal time and of endless space. And yet that grandeur is held for a brief moment within our earthly lives. The God who is three in one and one in three calls us to worship. Let us pray. Holy God, may you stream through our worship today like a river of living water. May you refresh our hearts and minds and souls. May you give us gifts of insight and understanding. Carry us, we pray, on a tide of growing and changing. May we be watered by the grace of your creative spirit. It is in the name of Jesus the Christ that we worship and we pray. Amen. So good morning. Welcome. Today is Trinity Sunday. It's also the June long weekend, of course, so there's a number of people away and uh, in one of those weird synchronicity things, the great Christian festivals of Christmas and Easter and uh, by celebrating the Queen's birthday this weekend, uh, we, we happen, to match, happen to match it with Trinity Sunday as well. Let's offer our worship to our God with our hymn of invocation. It's hymn number 155, How Great Thou Art.
And having sung the greatness of God in such grand style, we pause now and offer a confession. Let us pray. Holy God, knowing you as wisdom means that you are an ambiguous voice amongst us. For sometimes we're tempted to believe that the voice of wisdom is ours alone. And in our worship this day, we ask that you might call us again in truth. And there are some times that we hear your voice of wisdom, holy God, and it makes us feel uncomfortable. We choose to deny that we've heard it. We argue with it. We denounce its message to us. And we ask, holy God, for that you might forgive us. And you might call us again to your awesome truths. If we are afraid to listen to your wisdom, holy God, because it's too painful, too challenging, or even too merciful because we are not ready for your grace, holy God, forgive us. Call us into your truth and renew us. For in your truth lies our life and our hope. We name you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as our God. And we bring our prayers in Jesus' name. Our wisdom would tell us that we are rarely worthy of our calling as God's children. God's wisdom, though, through the Holy Spirit, brings us the good news that if we confess our failings, even in our humanness, we're loved by God. We're offered free grace and forgiveness. This is the wisdom of God, wisdom that moves us towards a never-ending flow of love. We remind ourselves of the promise of Scripture that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And having confessed together, been reassured of our forgiveness, we're free to share the peace. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Could I invite you by eye contact or gesture to make uh, the sign of the peace for some someone else nearby, someone friendly. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. So before we get to this Sunday, Trinity Sunday and its themes, we need to deal with uh, the leftovers of last week, Pentecost. The psalm for Pentecost was the wonderful Psalm 104. And Antoinette McSherry very kindly agreed to share with us a piece of artwork for last Sunday that was on a table as you went into morning tea and uh, it was thought a good idea to have another chance to have a look at it. So perhaps as you come through for morning tea later this morning, you might have a look at this piece of art. A uh, bit of a trivia question. What Does anyone know the word for uh, a multi-layered piece of art like this? If there's three, it's a triptych, I think. There's a Latin word. Does anyone know it other than Antoinette who told me? The word? Leporello. This piece of art is a leporello. I'm glad I wasn't the only one who didn't know that, Antoinette. So we go from Pentecost to Tr Trinity Sunday. The Sunday when we claim the, the God we know is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit entirely controversial to the great monotheistic religions of Islam and Judaism, an atrocity to them. And yet it's the way that for 2,000 years Christians have come to understand, to begin with, who Jesus was and where Jesus fitted in, fully human but fully God. And then, of course, after that, who the Holy Spirit was. And we Christians say that we know God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's a bit of a, a mind-bending Sunday. Well, that's not uh, easy maths. It's also not uh, a natural thing to believe, and yet Christians have consistently said that it's important for us, and I hope our reflection, our reflections together this Sunday take us to, uh, to why a 
Trinitarian faith is significant. And interestingly enough, despite its complexities, uh, hymn writers have uh, captured a lot of truth in the Trinity, maybe because three verses is a good number of verses for him to have, or maybe because uh, hymn writers have a way of getting to truth. And so we're going to now sing, before we hear from the scriptures, we're going to sing uh, one of these Trinitarian hymns. This is D.T. Niles' Father in Heaven, the hymn number 465. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. From Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Does not wisdom call and understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand, beside the gates in front of the town. At the entrance of the portals she cries out, to you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all who live. From Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 to 31. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there no, were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped. Before the hills, I was brought forth when he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. 
When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker and I was daily his delight, playing before him always, playing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. The second reading is Psalm 8. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are humans that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crown them with glory and honour. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The gospel reading is John sixteen, twelve to fifteen. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said, that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. For the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Thanks, Joanne. Let's just pause again for a word of prayer let us pray gracious god we thank you for your word a light for our path and a lamp for our feet and we pray your blessing as we seek to interpret your word we pray in jesus name amen 
The coming around each year of Trinity Sunday takes me back to an ongoing nightmare, a memory of uh, someone very significant and powerful who uh, filled my boots with fear. I was taught theology at the United Theological College in the mid-1980s by a curmudgeonly old grump called uh, the Reverend Dr. Alan Loy. Alan was a man who, at the height of his theological powers in the mid-1960s, had helped the church shape up its intellectual opposition to the war in Vietnam. He'd been a very significant figure in, in church circles. But by the time I knew him, he was a pretty scary bloke. He was a very deep thinker. He had the brain the size of a planet. And uh, for him, thinking was a, a passionate exercise. He'd, he'd tear out his hair as he uh, sought to explain the uh, complicated truths of the Christian gospel to ordinary people, ordinary theological students like me and like my colleagues. It was always scary when we'd written Alan an essay because he would uh, come into the lecture hall shaking his head talking about how much black coffee he'd had to drunk, drink, how he had obviously failed in instilling his uh, knowledge and wisdom into the heads of us, uh, us adults. At the heart of his theology was an understanding about the crucifixion of Jesus, the crucified redeemer. He was very much a Good Friday man. His, uh, his theology was scary and fierce and dark. The principal of the theological at the time, a Kiwi called uh, Graham Ferguson, had an entirely different theology. He was a man of the resurrection. And Alan and Graham would always disagree fiercely whenever there was a theological conversation to be had in the common room. Alan, though, was not without his uh, good points. He had, uh, in midlife, divorced and remarried a much younger woman. and. As a 60-something-year-old man, he was raising this little boy. He came into our theological uh, lecture one, theology lecturer one morning, shaking his head, this time with a bit of a smile on his face. For his little boy had said to him, Daddy, if God's got the whole world in his hands, what's he standing on? Alan found that, uh, that question intriguing. And you can imagine a man whose PhD was in theology seeking to understand, offer an answer to uh, this little boy. But it was always the subject of the Trinity that gave us the most uh, fear from Alan, for he had no patience at all for ordinary ministers of the word trying to explain the Trinity. And probably the scariest of lectures in the year was the theology lecture the, the week after Trinity Sunday. For Alan would come into the lecture theatre shaking his head this night, not time, not with a gleam in his eye, but with fire. One plus one plus one equals one, Alan said one, one uh, Trinity Sunday week. As if that explains the Trinity, he said. And uh, we sat in the lecture theatre thinking, well, kind of explained it for us, but uh, we dare not say that out loud. The Trinity is one of those theological truths that it seems to me is best understood as something of a mystery, for if you delve right into its details, you end up as uh, commungently and cranky as my friend Alan Moy. We lived in fear of, of Alan. Most of us lived in fear of the thought of being his minister once it came time for him to pass from this life because he had very strong views about coffins being in uh, funerals and about uh, not making false claims about the power of the resurrection. Alan eventually died one Sunday morning in church, one Sunday, one Christmas morning actually, over at the North Ride Community Church. And I've forgotten now who was the minister there at the time, but. Uh, Nobody envied the, the task of burying poor Alan. There's an intriguing story that I'm sure you're all aware about the way medieval people dealt with witches. 
If there's a question about a woman in the town, is she a witch at the heart of uh, the evil of the Dark Ages? The way to test that was to take her down to the lake and throw her in. If she drowned, she was not a witch, which is, of course, uh, <laughs> the terrible reality of that sort of inquiry. But if she did, she cle clearly was and uh, she needed to be tortured to death. Seems to me that trying to get to the heart of the, uh, of the meaning of the Trinity is a little bit like that kind of inquiry. By the time you've got to the heart of it, you've defeated the power of it. It's an interesting truth that of all the great feast days of the Christian church, the only one that is actually about a doctrine of the church is this one. Other feast days that we celebrate, celebrate a person, a saint, or an event like Christmas and Easter and Pentecost. Trinity Sunday is the day we celebrate something that we believe. And of course, at its heart, a, a Trinitarian faith is actually something that shapes us in a way that has us ready for dealing with the world in which we live in 21st century Australia. What modern theologians say about the Trinity, it's a little bit less harsh and scary than what my friend Reverend Dr. Alan Loy said about it. Modern theology has uh, sought to explain the, the Trinity in a way that uh, talks about its diversity. Christianity, religions in general, often want to talk about life in monochrome ways, in ways that are simple and clear. But this metaphor at the very heart of our Christian faith says something different. The Trinity talks about a diversity encapsulated within a unity. And so the simplicity of, uh, of oneness is completed with the complexity of a triune nature. Diversity, it seems to me, is the one thing that we've learned about in this country, the one significant thing that we've learned about this country in recent years. The world in which I grew up in as a child, a very white bread world. We thought in very colonial, British kind of ways. And we imagined the world being much like us. But that world is gone forever. The immigration boom that, uh, that has followed that period and the uh, the variety of understanding, variety of ways of understanding life mean that uh, the world in which we live is now much more diverse and complex and better place. I love living in Crow's Nest for a number of reasons. It was one of the main ones was encapsulated for me a couple of years ago and the council had uh, some banners up just at the beginning of the five ways there, which talked about this being a diverse community. That's what makes places like the Lower North Shore of Sydney good places, where rich and poor live together, black and white, gay and straight. It's diversity that makes life rich and good. And it's the, the tendency of, of capitalism to drive people apart and put them in their own places to divide rich from poor that uh, is, of course, the enemy of uh, sane society. Diversity is good. The LGBTIQ community have taught us that. And by listening to their story, we've become much richer for it, haven't we? Theological diversity is a difficult thing. Christian churches tend towards one plane or another. And yet again, when there's th theological diversity in a church or in a community, then there's a richness to be found that you wouldn't find if we were all the same, if we were monochrome. 
religious truths. There's always a temptation to want to have them pure and straightforward and clear. We want to believe that uh, the God that we uh, claim is exactly like us. And yet, of course, that is a foolishness. Complexity is what makes life good. An understanding of God that allows for uh, other people to, to look at God differently and come up with different conclusions remind us uh, of how the divine works, three and one, one in three. Trin the Trinitarian faith says all this just in one simple, <laughs> simple-ish doctrine. Diversity contained within oneness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, offers this truth offers a metaphor for living in a complicated, diverse, maybe even mess, messed up world. First few centuries of, of Christian history, as I'm sure you're aware, were uh, given over to the, working out this trinity. Various councils of the church, like Nicaea, drew people together. People lost their lives for believing the wrong things about the trinity. I did a lot of thinking about numbers and about maths. The early Cappadocian theologians looked at the number one and thought that uh, there was not, nothing good about it because it was just that, just one. There was no diversity within it. They weren't so keen on, on number two because that uh, was the challenge that the early Christians had to, uh, had to fight off dualistic understandings that was going to go nowhere but as the early christian theologians shaped up the church they found the number three to have a richness that those other two did not have it was complex it was diverse like a triangle it had stability and uh, that stability led to a durability and strength that the Christian church claimed. And we don't say the Trinity is the only symbol of diversity for Christians. For, of course, uh, when we read the scriptures, we see a diversity of voices speaking, don't we? At the very beginning of the Bible, there are those two creation accounts. In the, in the beginning of the New Testament, there's four Gospels. And it's that uh, diversity that... Uh, that has served the church well to understand that unity does not mean uniformity. Unity can come from diversity and difference, and that leads to richness. Jesus, the Son of God, the mystery of the incarnate Christ, important theological understandings need to be claimed to understand who Jesus is. And as we discovered last week, at the heart of Christianity was the moment when the Holy Spirit came upon the church and uh, enlivened them. One plus one plus one equals three, equals one did not satisfy my friend uh, Alan Loy, but down through the centuries there have been different ways for uh, ordinary thinkers to understand who the Trinity is. St. Patrick, of course, explained to the Celts the Trinity by talking about a shamrock, the three individual leaves, yet one plant. Other theologians have attempted similar sleight of hand to, to, to understand the, the, the Trinity. And yet it took for me, until the liberation theologians of the, of the 20th century to get to the heart of a trinity that made sense. Leonardo Boff describes the trinity like this as a community, just and equal within the reality that is God, and therefore a model for human society. 
Seems to me a Trinitarian faith makes suggestions to us about how we should uh, shape our society, what Christians should be working for when they work for the common good. Yes, it's complicated. Yes, it would be simpler to be old fashioned monotheists like the, uh, the Jews and, and the Muslims. And yet we Christians have found strength in our belief. How do we encounter God? We all have different answers to that question. But we're all on different journeys. But the Trinity is at its heart a way of getting to the sense of, of who God is. Trinity Sunday reminds us that we baptise children in the name of the Father and of the, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Reminds us that three in one, one in three is unity and diversity. If we can uh, just grasp that little part of the Trinity, then I would suggest that that's probably enough for uh, people of faith in the 21st century. Let's just pause for prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the ways in which you've revealed yourself to human beings down through the centuries. And we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, and life giver. And in the unity of the Godhead, we see diversity that leads us to life. We pray your blessing as we seek to understand our faith, particularly this day, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. You, Holy God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you live and reign as one God forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing again. Again, a, a hymn that uh, opens up the truths that we claim about the Trinity. It's a hymn number 405 in the, the hymn book, A Spirit of the Living God.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out on such a crisp morning. Um, next Sunday, we have the 45th anniversary of the Uniting Church in Australia. So we have uh, morning tea, special morning tea. And if there's anyone who can give Rod a lift next Sunday, please come and let us know. Um, Michael is going to be, he'll be here next Sunday, but after that he's going to be on leave for a few weeks. So if there's anything you need to talk to him about, make sure you do it soon. Um, there is a notice about Elijah, Mendelssohn's Elijah, which is on at the concourse on Sunday the 3rd of July, and it's in the afternoon, so 2 p.m. Um, and thank you to all the people who've brought donations for the Wayside Chapel. We have an overflowing box, so Anu will be very happy when we give that to her. And that's all from me. For the prayers, when you hear me say, God of glory, in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Praise to you, O God, creator, word and spirit, for your glory is beyond our knowing, yet you take delight in the human race. Hear the prayers we bring for your people. Creator God, you formed the waters and the dry land, and your fingers set the stars and moon in the heavens. Hear our prayers for the earth and its creatures. We pray for your people whose lands and livelihoods are destroyed, for those who live in places of war, oppression, or deprivation, including in Ukraine, Yemen, and Ethiopia. Unite your people in a community of justice that we may live together in peace and care responsibly for the world you have entrusted to us. God of glory, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Wisdom and word of God, created by God at the beginning of time, you chose to dwell with the children of humanity. Hear our prayers for your worldwide church. We pray for the church in places where it is persecuted or ignored, 
for church leaders and for all who minister or serve in your name. Unite your people in a community of faith that we may grow in understanding of your word and proclaim your gospel in all of the world. God of glory, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Spirit of God, you hovered over the waters of creation and you are with us today, bringing love and peace. Hear our prayers for those whose lives we share. We pray for those in society who are disadvantaged or neglected, for our families and our friends, for each other and for ourselves. We pray especially for the Barnett family. Unite your people in a community of love that we may support the weak, care for the vulnerable and welcome the outsiders in our midst. God of glory, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Three in one God, you give life to your people, comforting us in our sorrows and sustaining us in our needs. Hear our prayers for all who suffer. We pray for the grief stricken, the broken hearted and all in despair. For those who are overworked and for those who with no work, for the sick and all who are close to death. Unite your people in a community of compassion that we may bring consolation to the suffering and uphold one another in times of need. God of glory, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, you reign in majesty and you crown your people with glory and honor. Hear our prayers for your faithful servants. We remember the saints and the martyrs those of this parish who have gone before us and all whose yearly remembrance occurs at this time. Unite your people in a community of hope that at our life's end, we may be raised to eternal life to share with all your saints in glory. God of glory, creator, word and spirit, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, yours will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
And so now we leave this place in peace, resting in the wisdom of the Spirit, carried on a cloud of trust in the ultimate safe ground of God's being. And may wisdom sing to our souls in grace. May Jesus the Christ speak clearly in truth around us. And may God the loving Father hold us in faith. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord.